Hi there. I'm visiting the University of Virginia and I thought I'd pop in to say hello to all of you because the universe has conspired for me to meet somebody special and it's, it's been quite a treat. Those of you who know my story know that I had cancer and survived and experienced what is referred to as a near-death experience and this happened to me back in 2006. During that time, I was in Hong Kong and I had a doctor, a, a GP, my family doctor, who was with me and treating me and was with me throughout the whole process of what happened. So I haven't seen him since 2007 because he moved to Australia and subsequently several years later, I moved to the US. Well, by some synchronicities and stars aligning in the right place, he happens to be here today. And so I met him today for the first time after 12 years, and we decided to sit down and have a little conversation together, and we thought we'd put it on film for you. Hi, Brian. It's so good to see you. <laughs> it's great to see you as well. Come on. Let's get I can't believe it's been 12 years. 12 years. Oh my yeah. gosh, 12 years. So one of the things I loved about you at that time was that you used to make me laugh. And doctors don't normally do that. I mean, the doctors at the hospital were really scary. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We get paid the big bucks for that. I know, to, to be serious. But I'll tell you one thing. Don't trust doctors. <laughs> Says a doctor. I, I, to everyone I say this, listen... This idea, trust me, I'm a doctor, no. <laughs> I, look, I mean, it's not that we're bad guys, it's just that we've got a profession there which is really narrow and doesn't look outside these boundaries, we miss an awful lot. And the second thing you'll find is, you've got to look hard to find the doctor who listens. The number of times I've had patients say to me, you know, the first doctor is listening to me, and I get so sad. Yeah. Because that, that, that's, that's, that's sad. That's why we loved you, because you, you would listen. Um, and, of course, you knew how dire my condition was, and, uh, but you didn't, you, you didn't make me feel it was dire. It wasn't until um, I went into the coma and then was dealing with the other doctors. So what did you feel that day when I went into the coma that day? I mean, you, you thought I was gone, didn't you? I, well, it started long before that. When, yes. when Danny says to me, this is Brian, says, brother, friend of mine, says, would you look after my wife? And I said, yeah, for sure. And he says, there's only one condition. You can't mention the cancer. And I thought, oh, okay. Oh, okay. And, but I tried. Yeah, you you may, I, I asked you open questions. You may not know. I was asking you open questions to see if you would actually let me in. But no, that, that came down. You were very clearly terrified. Absolutely. And so all I could do, basically, was to, to work with you on that. And this is where you're at. My job is to do the best I could for you with all the stuff that I was doing, which is all, all mm, different to what uh, doctors normally prescribe. So when you, in that last week, I'll never forget it, you sat in front of me, desperately ill, desperately ill, and the look in your eyes, it was, you said to me, Brian, you said, I can't do this anymore. I give up. And in your face was this resignation, you are resigned to your fate, if you like. And I felt like the worst doctor in the world. Because had I sent you so much earlier, something might have been done. But no, I was sending you to your certain death. Yeah. I knew that of a certainty. You do not get better from this. Yeah. I Wow. That's... And I remember I was in the wheelchair mm. in in front of you, and I was I had the oxygen tank, mm. and um, yeah, and I said I give up. This is it. And I had been taking the fluid off your, your chest how many times? Yes. yes. And then you could breathe again, and here you were. It was it was it was it was horrible, really. It, it, I, I I seriously thought, and the doctor I sent you to, I referred you to, must have thought, what kind of doctor is this? My reputation is shocked in Hong Kong. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And then, and then you were in the hospital when I when I arrived in the hospital in the coma, weren't you? No, I wasn't. I, I I was I was kept when that happened. I was kept far away because I wasn't part of the team. I was entirely separate from that. So I said goodbye to you, thinking this is it. 
Okay, and off you went, and I was left there thinking, okay, here we are. Yeah. Let's carry on. And so, when a few days later, when Danny came in, and I, I thought, okay, uh, a conversation with, with the grieving radio with, with, my, with my brother, uh, and he came in, and again, the look on his face, I'll never forget it. He was on a different planet altogether. It, it, his face was, I got no idea what had happened. He came in completely away. I said, Daddy, what happened? He said, You'll never believe what happened, he says. <laughs> and what did he say to you that day at the Well it was a, and then and then she, she she came back again. What? Okay? And there's a whole conversation about this. Of course you still needed you're still in hospital, you were still I was still critical, yeah. Yes. Uh, but the, the fact that this had happened and oh my god. Oh my god. It was only later when you and Danny both came in. And you had the same look on your face as Danny. Yeah. <laughs> you, you did. Uh, this, okay, I've been through this. Your past life had completely gone. It no longer mattered. That, that was the past. Here you sat with a new beginning. Okay? And you asked me, what do we do with this? <laughs> and I sat back to thinking, I haven't the faintest idea. <laughs> so, no. So, so, you, you mentioned about, no, we'll get a web page maybe, and I was thinking, oh, okay, web page, what's that going to do? I, I have no idea about this. Uh, how do you move on into a new, it's just, it, nothing, nothing is as it was before. So here we are, newborn, if you like. Yeah. And you can do anything you like, but what? Yeah, and for me, what I was thinking, the only thing that was going through my head was that I need to help other people because mm. I felt... I have come through this certain death through cancer where everybody thought I was going to die. Everybody was certain I was going to die. I should have died. And I think the first thing I was thinking is, how do I let other people know this? I need to help them. I need them. I wanted to shout it from the rooftops that, that death is not what you think it is. Cancer is not what you think it is. I just wanted everyone to know. Well, this is, I have to let you into a secret. Yeah. Your book, when it came out, I bought it. Yeah. It took me five years before I could open it. It was, I was, I was confronted. Yeah. I mean, this type of happening, this, this, this miracle, if you will, really requires you to actually redefine what you think. Now, most doctors will say, oh, that's very interesting. Well, maybe do a study on this and next patient, please, and we'll carry on as normal. Yeah. Okay. Or you can say, what does this actually mean? The impossible Happened. So the impossible is not impossible, it's possible. Why? Who are we? What are we? Where do we go with this? And so it started, and I've been on that path for a long way already, with this theoretical idea about your energies and uh, who are we really. You made it actually really focused there. And uh, so, so my trajectory changed as well, because then I became very much more positively certain that we are not who we think we are. We're not. Um, and you can use the science to, uh, I am a scientist, you can use the science to absolutely say this is why, although we don't know the details, but the basic principles scientifically are very well founded. <clears throat> so when you get my scientific colleagues saying, oh, that can't be possible, I'm saying, you haven't understood the science, mm -hmm. but you haven't looked at this question deeply enough. Uh, so you're using that as a kind of a prop to not have to think about facts. And that was my, that, that, that took me into a different place. Wow. And, um, and I'm really glad you read my book and it, and yes. Yeah, so, but it's interesting that it took you five years to read it. I found that interesting when you told me that earlier, because, um, you said that it would, it would alter what you had based your, I guess, your life, your studies on. And, and, it, and you knew it was, it would change everything. Or well, it did. It was, but it was also very painful because bear in mind, I looked at myself as playing a very, very minor role and an, an insignificant, not, not very useful role. So my position in all of that was basically one of failure. I didn't manage to save your life. Oh. I, and, and the challenges that you threw up there, I had, I had dropped the ball, if you like. And then there's this concept here of the, 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 the how does the cancer vanish? That, that, um, because there's the cancer, we've got to do something about that, but that question is wrong. 
Yeah. So, so it, it took me, as a, as, a, as a physician, it took me a long time before I could get the courage to actually get to grips with this. Because you challenged me to, to restructure how I feel about illness. Wow. So I, wow, that's, that's interesting. That it's yeah. quite something. And, and also, I had no idea that you, that it made you feel like a failure. That you, because you weren't able to help me at that time. But you have no idea how much you did help me, actually. You really did, because you were one of the few doctors that was able to make me laugh. Now, here, here's another piece I wanted to, I wanted to share with you, um, is that before that, before I came to see you, um, I'd already had the, I'd already had cancer for a little while. And it was progressing. Now, what happened is I went to India. And when I went to India, I was in an environment where they never used the word cancer. So I was in, I followed an Ayurvedic doctor and a yoga master. And I was told that what you have is an imbalance in your body. And as long as we focus on the imbalance and bring you back to balance, there will be no room in your body for cancer. The cancer would heal. Your own body will heal whatever other ailments, and so you will not have cancer. And I stayed there for six months, and sure enough, um, I could feel the lymph nodes getting softer and dissolving, and I could feel myself getting back to normal. And uh, you remember how big the lymph nodes were when you saw me anyway, so I could feel them getting back to normal. And so I was in an environment where the word cancer wasn't even used. Because you can imagine for a lot of people, that word cancer is a trigger. It's a big, fearful word. Um, so as I watched it dissolve, it was almost all gone. I came back to Hong Kong, back to the medical paradigm where my best friend was going through cancer and she was dying. And I was back in that environment where I started talking to people and they were saying, how are you doing? How's your lymphoma? And I said, it's, it's great. It's getting much better. And they would say, but what have you been doing? Have you been seeing an oncologist? And I said, no, I went to India. I did this. And pardon my language, but I swear there were people that said, that's pure BS. That's BS. You can't do that. That's too risky. You have to go get a scan. You have to see an oncologist. And I was immersed back into that, that medical paradigm, which for me, triggered huge fears because I was watching my best friend die from cancer and she was getting the best oncological treatment that money could buy in Hong Kong at that time. Now, this is actually exactly what uh, Dr. Joe Dispenza writes about. I love his book, Me too. You Are the Placebo. It's one of the few books I've had to read every sentence twice. <laughs> it's absolutely gorgeous. Now, <clears throat> so the not that many people realize every single one of us has got at least one cancer cell in our bodies every day. Up to 600 cancer cells floating around our bodies. So the, the real question is, why don't we all have cancer? And the answer is because the immune system will actually remove these abnormal cells. It's not a problem mainly of the, uh, the sick cells, it's a problem of a weak immune system. And I generally find that uh, six months prior, prior to the diagnosis of cancer, there's often been a stress or a stressor of some major form, which, which causes this to weaken the immune system. And, and I postulate that cancer may be encouraged, not not caused, but encouraged to, to develop uncontrolled. So managing the immune system, which is what I was doing with yourself, yes. uh, is, I think, uh, crucial to, to um, um, working side by side with the other options uh, for managing cancer. Um, and that, that's a technical three-dimensional, the, the classical medical, alternative medical uh, approach, which not that many doctors espouse, but it should be normal. What you have pointed out is that we need to go further beyond that into a more energetic level of, of wellness and humanity, uh, which uh, is something that medicine simply has no idea about. Yes. Uh, and that's really where the future ought to be. That's a, a whole different topic. A hundred percent. And I agree with you. And... I actually, you know, so when you were mentioning earlier that you felt that uh, you had failed, in fact, on the contrary, it was my environment that failed me. It is the, the paradigm that we live in. Because I actually believe that if I was not surrounded by people who made me feel that what I was doing was crazy 
and that it was BS. And if I was not surrounded by somebody who was being treated in the hospital and surrounded by that environment, I actually would have done really well because I did really well when I was in India in an environment where I didn't have that conflict of the other side. You see, that is what was putting the doubts in my head. And that is why I was telling Danny that, that you know, I was getting well in India because I, I didn't have to deal with the fact that people are telling me that I have cancer and, and, and it's really scary to think that. And so, hence, he even said to you, don't talk about cancer. I was trying to create an environment where I didn't feel I was dealing with cancer and that I was focused on healing. So in other words, I like to think in terms of focusing on the healing and the trajectory of our healing as opposed to focusing on the trajectory of the illness. Because what oncologists tend to do is they tend to see what you have and then they tell you the trajectory of that illness should it continue on the path that it should be going instead of telling you what is possible if you now turn it around and change your path. Mm -hmm. Exactly so. I think uh, oncology, they, it's a hard job uh, yes. because they are very firmly fixed in this three-dimensional model, which I think is very unhelpful. And it must be a very depressing business to be in. So uh, all, all power to them and, and many thanks, but I think it's deeply unhelpful. You had, however, a, a really important uh, uh, assistance because I have never, I must, I must uh, uh, tell all the husbands out there, uh, Danny is probably the best example of a husband I could ever hope to find. I really admire your husband. He was terrified. He knew uh, that, uh, or he, I don't know if he knew or not, but everyone's telling him to do this, uh, but you were going that way. And he stood side by side with you and supported you, encouraged you, strengthened you, uh, and he put his own fears to the back, subsumed his, con his concern for your benefit. And I, I admire your husband. He's, I know, I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for him. He is, um, I wouldn't be able to do a lot if it wasn't for him. I, I love my husband. That he is clear. He's, he's, he's a keeper, I think. Oh, he's a keeper. <laughs> he's, and he shares the same hairstyle as you. It's the best. No combing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Oh. But the, the whole science uh, that, that, that see, you have proposed a challenge uh, to uh, the whole of medical society. Oh, good. There, there, there's, <clears throat> there's this uh, impossible cancer which suddenly resolves. And if you're not asking the question of why, then you're not dealing with the real problem. So we need to look, what, what, what are we actually dealing with? How, how are we built? What are we made of? And you could say, we've spoken about this before, that we're all stardust, and we are. Every leaf of every tree you pass by is made of atoms which were once in a star somewhere. Not even the same star. And that, that's, that's amazing enough. But if you break down those atoms into the subatomic particles, the muons, gluons, quarks, and break those down, what we're getting isn't a particle at all. It's, an, it's a waveform. It's an energy. Now, that's, that's stunning as well, because then we are all distortions of the space-time continuum. Our reality is not this three-dimensional temporary coalition of molecules, but actually an energy that existed before our bodies and will exist after our bodies. So maybe we ought to look at using energy as a method of treating this three-dimensional body um, rather than just three-dimensional chemicals or the knife. There's a lot more we could look at. Medicine needs to go down that path because that's who we really are. But it also puts into perspective, I think, the idea of we must save life at all costs. I get patients coming to me with cancer or other illness saying, Doc, am I going to die? And I say, yeah, yeah, maybe not now, but are you living? Yeah, it's all, it's all very well breathing, having a heartbeat, being, uh, being, you know, having life in your body, but are you living? Are you enjoying every breath you take in, every sight you see? Does it, does it awaken in you the, the, the joy of being a part of this immense universe, this wonderful creation of where wonders are around every corner? It's, 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 a, it's a gorgeous thing to, to be, but no, we look at the bill coming in and we have to pay that. And we're looking here at the problem or the neighbor over the fence has said something bad to me. That, that is not who we are. 
And this is what, what you point out, not just about the, 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 the sake of wellness, but also life in general. Who are we? Why are we? Where are we going? What are we going to do about it? And what action do I need to do in my life right now to take me a step forward towards that goal? I love that. I love that. Oh my God, that's amazing. So, you know, to me now, um, you are prop to me, I see you as like the best doctor in the world. Who? Oh, I think I'm the worst. <laughs> and you are the best. And that's the thing, because if anybody, so I don't, just like that day, you said that day that Danny and I came into your office and we said, we don't know what to do with this. Um, and we figured our way out. But now I'm going to ask you, with everything you experience, with everything you feel now, you don't fall into the normal paradigm of being a physician, whatever. So what are you going to do with all this? Because if you are practice, practicing in some form of other as an in integrative practitioner or whatever, I would be the first person to stand up and say, this guy is the best doctor ever, and I would tell everybody to go and see you. So what are you going to do with the rest of your life with all this stuff that you now have experienced? And know? Well, the first thing I'm going to do is switch off my alarm. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Now, that alarm actually was a reminder to myself that I'm strong, caring, and fearless. Uh, love it. Something I need to, to remind myself of, because I, we all of us, we have this voice inside ourselves saying, you can't, you're not good enough, uh, insufficient, um, and that, that's just plain wrong. So we need to remind ourselves on a regular basis that actually we are very different. We can do the impossible. We are we are something more than this, what we see just now. And our thoughts are really important. So my, my conclusion for how am I going to move forward is that I'm leaving medicine. Oh, wow. Uh, look, um, I, I, look I, can, I can fix people. I can sew people together. I can, I can uh, diagnose things. I like their cardiology. But that, that's the medicine I think I need to leave behind because I'm not actually managing wellness. And, Really, it's all about wellness, nutrition, exercise, and mental health in particular. And um, so I cannot do that one-on-one, uh, -on -one, behind the desk, in my clinic, or at my hospital. I can't do that because people are coming to me, and they are not where you are at. They are not where I'd like us to be in this understanding of we need to be responsible for our wellness, and it starts inside here in your soul. So um, what I'd like to do very much is to uh, practice full-time what I've been dabbling in over the years. And so I'm moving towards that. Wow, that's that's a big step. That's huge. Mm. And um, and so I think this is related, like the reason you're, you're leaving. Um, I want to talk about how other doctors and other physicians or oncologists react to a case like mine. Um, even though they know it happens, they will dismiss it. And is it because it's really hard to integrate it into their practice. Well, first off, uh, what, what do you went through is impossible. So when other doctors hear about that, they say, well, that's a, that's, that's a lie, that can't be, no, it, it's, it's fake, it's sham, it's a scam. I've been accused of that. And yes. um, uh, that's, Thank God you were there to see it. Well, indeed, because it, it's really very difficult to believe because this does not happen, but it did. Therefore, something is wrong. Either what you've told me is wrong or the system I've learned is wrong. And it's very easy to believe that what you told me is wrong. So most doctors would, would say, no, no, need more evidence, uh, document that. And it has been documented, but yeah. still, even then, um, uh, there's many cases where the documentation, oh, we can't believe that, the research, no, there's, there's a whole body of, of research out there which is ignored by medical society because it doesn't fit the paradigm of the medical business. Yes. Um, there's many, many examples, and it really is actually a shameful for, for uh, I think, us as doctors that we allow this to continue. Um, if the doctor does think, well, there's something special there, they've really got a lot of barriers to overcome to start taking it a step further. First of all, who teaches the doctors about this? There's not many of us around there. Secondly, you've got to overcome the fear of, A, being laughed at, because I've been laughed at so many times uh, by... Uh, uh, by doctors' colleagues who simply can't believe what's actually going on. And secondly, and this is major, when you pop your head up above the parapet of medical uh, uh, professional boundaries, 
When you do that, you get shot down by the, the, the professional boards, who then say, you are no longer within the boundaries, and therefore we're going to sanction you, we'll take your license off you, now you can't work. And, and how many people are brave enough to say, you need to actually take a step backwards, because you are, you are responsible for killing so many of our population, so you back off. Uh, a good example is in America, there's a, in every year there are 112,000 deaths annually caused by the properly prescribed medications which have been properly administered. That's a lot of world trade centers yeah. and not one single voice is saying, we need a war to fight against this. No. Yeah. Okay, so we are being literally, when doctors go on strike, the death rate falls. Yes, I mean, just talking about that. For the love of God, I mean, pay attention, folks. And then, when you look at uh, the three pillars of wellness, in, in three-dimensional medicine, uh, more complementary, there's three pillars of wellness. Nutritional health, which doesn't mean eating three meals a day, it's eating what your body needs. Okay? Uh, uh, exercise health, which doesn't mean joining a gym and getting a body like Arnold Schwarzenegger, but moving your body the way it's meant to be moved, regularly. And thirdly, mental health, which doesn't mean not having a psychiatric diagnosis, but the ability to wake up to each dawning day with joy for the day that's coming with love for, for fellow man, with love for nature, uh, so that uh, we are full of, of boundless joy. Those are the three pillars of wellness. Now, doctors, your grandmother knows more about nutrition than your doctor. <laughs> From the exercise point of view, how many obese doctors do you see, or doctors who don't prescribe exercise, or who give you a pill for your back pain rather than actually prescribing exercise? And the third aspect about mental health, how often do we uh, abrogate that to someone who is fixed on telling you what happened in the past, take the medication now, and we'll make your problem easier to bear. And that, that passes as, as, as good mental health, if you can access the mental health. So the three foundations, the three pillars of, of, of wellness, are not being met within medical practice. That should give us cause for concern. Wow, hear, hear. Very, very well said. Oh my gosh. Very well said. And um, I know you're going to have like at least the people who watch my videos and listen to me speak, they're all going to agree with you 100%. <laughs> I attract a lot of people who are afraid of hospitals. They are afraid of having tests because they feel that, and, and this is how I feel too, which is why I attract such people, is because we feel that medical tests go in search for illness and they don't give up till they find it. I was actually just speaking to Dr. Bruce Grayson a little bit earlier, and I was telling him about how um, when my, um, you know, three weeks after the near-death experience, I was still in hospital, I was still weak, but um, they wanted to, they wanted to do a biopsy on me to find a lymph node to, yeah, they wanted a biopsy, a lymph node. So at that point, I couldn't feel any swollen lymph nodes. They'd all shrunk down in three weeks. Outrageous. Yes, and you remember that. And then I was sent to the radiologist's office to, um, for the radiologist to mark a lymph node, which the surgeon would then remove. Um, as the radiologist was working on me with the ultrasound, he was looking very, very confused. And so this was in Hong Kong, and he was speaking to me in English. Uh, and he said, oh, there's a problem. And I said, what's the problem? And he was trying not to tell me anything. So he was supposed to find something on the neck. He couldn't find something. So he tried the underarms. He couldn't find something. So he was like moving around trying to find, find a lymph node. Then he said, could you excuse me a moment? <laughs> then he went to the next room, picks up the phone, and calls my oncologist and speaks in Cantonese, not realizing that I can understand Cantonese. And he says to my oncologist, I can't even find a lymph node big enough to suggest cancer. And, uh, and there aren't any that, that is, that is feasible to remove. Then the oncologist is saying something to him and it sounded like they were getting annoyed or impatient. And then he goes, okay, 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 okay. And he hangs up and he comes back. And so all that was in Cantonese. He comes back. So I said to him, in fluent Cantonese to show him I understood. And I said that, um, so I guess we're not doing this then. And I was like really happy. I could get up and go. And he said, no, 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 not so fast. Your oncologist said that to mark an, a lymph node, she didn't care what lymph node, just mark a lymph node anyway. And sure enough, 
They mm. removed a lymph node. They sent it for the tests. It came back completely benign, suggesting there was no lymphoma in my system. And even then, they said it's not good enough. They then sent it further to another lab, like a John Hopkins type of lab, and uh, they said, we want to do further tests just to make sure. And this is the thing about hospitals and the uh, hospitals that specialize in cancer and research. They, they don't give up till they find something. There's something I, I very often say to, to patients of mine who are going through that process of having a cancer diagnosis and treatment. And it, it goes like this. I said, the person who's got the problem is you. And the person in charge of the problem is also you. You're the CEO of your body. People like me, the specialists, they are the advisors to the board. Yeah. And you need to listen to the advice. But if you think the advice is not good, you need to find someone else to listen to. And that, that's a, a prime concern. You're in charge of your body. You take control. Don't let yourself get put on a conveyor belt and put down that pathway yes. and let someone else take charge. That's the first thing. And the second thing is, if you're a doctor, is not comfortable being the advisor and not having control because you have control, you've got the wrong doctor. Yes. You're speaking my language. <laughs> wow, thank you. I think that was really, really great. I think that a lot of people will get a lot of value from what you said. And you know, Brian, what it is, whatever it is you choose to do in the future, whatever, whether you're speaking or, or practicing in some form, in a different form, please, please stay in touch with me. Well, you're going to see me online, you'll see my blog, you'll see my books, uh, but uh, that's all in the not too distant future, but I will stay in contact. Great, because I want to share it with my audience. Whatever you do, I'll share it with my audience. Love it, love you. Love you too. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you and bye. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you so much for tuning in to my video. And if you really enjoyed it, I would love for you to subscribe. And the subscribe button is here. And also I would love for you to watch my suggested video, which is over here. And if you love my content, please feel free to share it to people who you think that would benefit from it. Thank you.